of course, when a family member dies, a person feels grief for three days. We mourn for three days and three nights. So currently in Gaza, our relatives in Deen are dying daily. So we are in a state of grief in that regard. But it reminds me of 1895, Theodor Herzl, his diary. You find in his diary accounts before the official announcement of Zionism, that displacement of the ethnic groupings, meaning the Arabs, that are found in Palestine is essential to the Zionist project. So what we witness now is a containment and compromising of the Arabs. And I mention Arabs specifically because it includes the Christian Arabs that are located in Palestine also, which the Khilafah safeguarded, the Christian Arabs, and the Jews that resided in Palestine, they were always safeguarded by the Khilafah. Even during the reign of a Sultan Abdul Hamid Afani, And then in 1905, Arthur Balfour, who made the declaration in 1917 of, a, of Israel, of a Jewish homeland. Uh, in fact, Arthur Balfour, he was responsible for the Aliens Act in the UK in 1905 because Russia was expelling so many Jewish people because anti-Semitism is a symptom of Russia and Europe. So they were sending out the Jews, not permitting them to reside in Russia. And Arthur Balfour what, did not want Jewish people to reside in Britain. So he places this 1905 Aliens Act. And in fact, the Balfour Declaration is an anti-Semitic declaration. Why is it anti-Semitic? Because in its essence, it accepts a Jewish conspiracy that the Jews control the world. And therefore, the British government needs to follow the Zionist uh, philosophy in uh, determining a home place for the Jewish population. While in Islam, we've never had anti-Semitism. The Jews lived uh, side by side in Spain, the Sephardic Jews. And the Jews were welcomed by Sultan Abdul Hamid as Ahlu Dhimma, people of protection. Then we fast forward uh, with the containment and compromising of Arabs to our modern time in Gaza. That diary of Theodor Herzl relates to the current situation also, because displacement of Ahlu Gaza, displacing them from Gaza, entails that you repopulate that same area with other peoples from around the world, the diaspora, what they refer to as the Jewish diaspora of different ethnicities, not a homogenous group. They, ha they are not an ethnic uh, homogenous group. They are various different ethnicities. They place them dual nationals within the emptied land, that land which is then emptied of all the indigenous people who include Bani Israel, because many of the Palestinians are actually Bani Israel, but they adopted Islam as a deen, because Islam is colorblind when it comes to race, or ethnic groupings. So now the current situation, the containment of the Arabs, uh, and also what I mentioned, the compromising of, of the Arabs, is it, it, it comes out in the current nation states that we have, like Jordan, where Jordan is compromised, UAE is compromised. You have misguided fatwas of Abdullah bin Bayya, who is one foot in the grave and has no shame in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his student, Hamza Yusuf, who does not condemn Abdullah bin Bayya for his misguided verdict in validating a recognition of the state of Israel, mixing bananas and oranges between Hudna, which is a ceasefire, and a, and which, uh, a, ceasefire and a, a peace agreement, meaning total acceptance of uh, Israeli hegemony around the region and accepting Jerusalem as the capital of this illegal entity which is known as Israel. So we are compromised in terms of some of the ulama who are compromised, like Abdullah bin Bayya and others who may support him. But how do we counter this compromising of some of the nations, nation states who salute flags, they worship flags and constitutions, and they accept a paper currency, paper currency which does have its roots with uh, bankers who bought up some of the land in the 1890s in Palestine, they actually bought up land 
for, to allow settlers to come and uh, settle in that land. And then you have American foreign policy, which is also compromised by the Israel lobby. The Israeli lobby is not actually a conspiracy. It's just a loose organization of various interest groups. But you look at the policies of America post-1967, you read the accounts, you will find that increase for support for Israel uh, was post-1967. There was a spike. And not only this, you find that after 1979, when Anwar Sadat, when he accepted Israel, there were many clauses in that agreement, but the aid efforts, aid was increased to Egypt by America. Similarly, aid was increased to Jordan in 1994 after uh, the King of Jordan accepted Israel. And uh, this aid is one of the main reasons why those states are compromised. And this is why the Pakistani army, for instance, is compromised. We know the, the gift aids that the Pakistani army is given. The Pakistani army is actually on the grid of uh, the nexus, you can say, of uh, merch, those who buy arms from uh, the global elite that make those arms in the Pakistani army is one of the market forces that purchases those arms, like the Turkish army, which is also compromised with Erdogan's Urdu deals with gas. As you mentioned to me once, Dili, with regard to the gas deal that was done a few weeks ago and many other military deals which are done. This is the compromise part. The containing, as I mentioned, is a, a genocide and ethnic cleansing, removing the indigenous people from the lands. What is the solution? The solution includes an, a, an active pressing for opening of borders because opening of borders entails much more. If we as Muslims united on the front of demanding the opening of all borders for aid to enter and for other things, then that will change the reality on the ground. That when you have a surge of Muslims entering from the border, the re the return of the Palestinians back to their homeland from the Nakba of 1948 when you had over 800,000 Palestinians displaced, they must return back. They must come back into Palestine because they, they will repopulate the area. And uh, 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 when they will repopulate the area, that will empower the Palestinians. And again, if Israel is permitted to be a Jewish state, then Palestine is an Islamic entity. I wouldn't use the word state. And lastly, what I would mention in this regard is the scam of the 1967 uh, border claim two-state solution. There are some naive Muslim ulama, politicians, of course, they, uh, they say this, but there are some naive ulama who call for the pre-1967 borders and they say, to call for anything else is just uh, in, uh, in relation to Hizb al-Tahrir or Ikhwan al-Muslimin. This is false. This is a false notion. The, if they understood how American foreign policy works, it works with what dangling a, a, a carrot to the people. But at the same time, America increased its don donations. The donors increased to illegal settlers. While they were discussing a two-state solution, they were entrenching themselves in the West Bank, entrenching themselves in Palestine. Uh, the three-zone tier system that they have is a scam. The entire two-state solution is a scam that America has been pushing while the Muslims have been buying this and they continue to buy this, like Mahmoud Abbas and others, other leaders continue to buy this. America, with its uh, Zionist lobby, is entrenching the settlers in, in, into the legal occupation the entire occupation is illegal, of course, but when you start relying on UN re resolutions, which the Muslims have been doing in Kashmir also, relying on resolutions which in of themselves are ineffective, they are inept, they have no active force on the ground. We need to realize that the UN has failed Muslims. Uh, the UN gave 55% of Palestine in 1948 to, in May 1948, to Israel. To the illegal entity. So the UN was culpable in giving the very entity that we, the land of Palestine to the illegal state. This same entity, the UN, is what it has no, it's vacuous. It's just statements that they give. 
And when we Muslims realize that we need to v establish our own autonomy with uh, min Allah from Allah, and that is that entails the re-establishment of the Khilafah as Jerusalem as the capital that needs to be announced on mass that we and as Muslims announce Jerusalem as the capital of the Muslim Khilafah and the Jews are welcome to stay. They are our guests as Ahlul Dhimma. Of course, they return all the land which has been plundered, but they, the, those Jews who want to remain, we are not anti-Semitical like Arthur Balfour, who believed in a conspiracy theory of global Jewry uh, controlling because the Jews were barred from occupations in Europe in the uh, Middle Ages. Many of them went into money laundering. And when they went into money laundering, some of them had influence, influence. They became influential as bankers, which the Rothschild family is one of those child uh, families that funded wars, the Napoleonic Wars. So because of this, Europe uh, uh, had deep uh, resentment against Jewish people and had anti-Semitic feelings, which went back to the time of Richard the uh, Richard the so-called Lionheart, the Lioness Heart. In his time, anti-Jewish riots broke out in the time of a Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi. In that time, they had the Saladin tax, the, the Salahuddin tax, and anti-Jewish riots broke out. So anti-Semitism is your problem, O West. It is your problem in the Western Hemisphere. It is your problem in Russia, where the protocols of Zion were forged. They were not forged by Muslims. We have al quran al Karim that gives us guidance. We do not need the protocols of the elders of Zion. And in order to understand how groups like J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs, which Rishi Sunak worked for, how these bankers influence the Federal Reserve and how they influence foreign policy. All of that is not hidden and it's not actually conspiracy theory. So uh, the Khilafah changes all of that because it changes our economic mindset. It changes our approach to civil liberty, to uh, social justice and our approach to militarization how we as Muslims do not condone nuclear bombs, a bomb which was made by Einstein, who was Jewish of descent and was offered the first presidency of the state of Israel. That is not without co coincidence that Einstein, uh, his science, his physics, played a major role in the invention of the, the atomic bomb, even though Einstein was regretful of this. And they, uh, David Ben-Gurion, the first president of Israel, Prior to him, Einstein was offered the presidency of the illegal state of Israel. The nuclear bomb, Muslims would never have thrown that. But the USA threw that nuclear bomb on Japan. So a country like the USA, which can throw nuclear bombs on its enemies, do not expect mercy from such a system, from such an entity that has no mercy on its enemies, which we witness with the, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that is why it comes to no surprise that there's, there is unrelenting uh, force being used in Gaza today with warships being placed on the Mediterranean against a civil population in the largest open air prison in the world. But the solution is an intellectual intifada where our minds wake up. Now, some of the youngsters, they're saying uh, a call for jihad. Let me tell you a fiqh a rule, a fiqh rule, which I was reading today in Al-Lubab when teaching the class, is that a taklif ala hasbil wat, a taklif meaning being obliged to do something is in accordance with ability, in accordance with ability. So the fard of jihad falls upon those military groups that have the ability, not upon civilians, not upon civilians, because lone wolves, they become the target of what? of intelligence services, intelligence agencies, they infiltrate all these jihadi groups. They have people in prison and they misguide many young people. Therefore, work according to your ability. And the first step is the intellectual intifada. We need an intifada, but that intifada be, needs to be intellectual. Shah Saraj, Zahullah Khair and Abdul Wahid, before I bring you in, there's three very important videos I want to play, totally related and appropriate for the concluding segment of the conversation. So Russia, can you please play video 28, 29 and 30, please? What am I supposed to do? I'm asking for help. 
I'm asking the Arab countries. I'm asking the Islamic countries. Now tell them are helping us. You saw that child. What did he, what did he do? What did the, what did the children do? المؤسسات الدولية اللي دائما بنشوفها وينها من حقوق الفلسطينيين في غزة؟ وينها ليش تنصرت وراحت؟ This country is fucking bro Israel. You should get out from here. Piece of shit. It's time for you to leave from here. I will not stop. You, President, sent two two ships, two ships sent to for Israel, supporting Israel. It's time for you to leave from here. Russian, can we see the last video of the Jordanian sister, please? <laughs> so very interesting videos very interesting comments uh, a sentiment that has been I, I have never seen such anti-regime sentiments like I have this time around Abdul Wahid I mean yes we've seen it we've seen it many a times whenever Palestine or Gaza is attacked we have but this time around it's been very poignant it's been very consistent it's not a call that's been associated to one group or one party or one movement. It really has been. We had uh, brothers and sisters, mainly brothers, marching to the Jordanian border. They were dispersed with tear gas. We had the same at the Lebanese border. Um, we had message from the Olympic Committee in Afghanistan, of the Islamic Emirates, saying, look, tell the Arab rulers, relax, open the borders, we will go. There's a lot of this happening now. Why is that, Abdul Wahid? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. It's happening because the ummah is waking up. The ummah has learnt not just about her Islam. She knows that the khilafah, the amir, the imam is a shield. Al-imam al-junna. She knows that the armies are there supposed to be to protect and rescue people. They're not meant to be there to protect the oppressor and prevent the uh, rescuing of the people. She has seen what happened on the 7th of October, smack in the face of the Zionist regime and exploding the myth of their invincibility, frankly. Okay, so it, 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 a few hundred people managed to show how vulnerable uh, the place is. So she knows that, the Ummah knows that it is possible to liberate. It is possible and that there is no excuse left. There is no excuse left. Look, we know as Muslims that victory doesn't come from material means. It doesn't come from your numbers. It doesn't come from how well equipped you are. It doesn't come from how well resourced you are. Victory comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. But actually, this ummah is not lacking in material means. If you look at the statistics, somebody looks at, if somebody wants to look at my social media feeds, there's an infographic there that compares the 14 closest Muslim countries to the Zionist occupation of Palestine and the Zionist occupiers in terms of their relative military capabilities. And I'm not talking about what Sheikh Asra talked about, a passionate young individual going there who does have no chance of liberating the land. I'm not talking about sincere resistance movements that actually by resisting are, um, constantly a thorn in the side of the occupier, but really those resistance movements don't pretend that they're going to liberate Palestine. 
I'm talking about the armed forces that are spent billions and billions and billions upon them, which have a relative strength compared to the Zionist entity, just of those 14 countries, between seven and 10 to one on every metric. I'm talking about expenditure. I'm talking about actual service personnel, professional, trained, full-time service personnel, not reservists. I'm talking about artillery. I'm talking about naval and air capacity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the means. And you know, in the modern world, you don't even first start thinking about military. You, you, people, it, when it comes to hostility between states, they talk about economic sanctions, energy sanctions, gas, electricity, these things. Really, you have not seen these Arab countries, which are oil rich, lift a finger in terms of using their power that they have in terms of oil and gas to help the people of Palestine never mind liberate them. You've not seen the Turkish government stop its defense and trade contracts. Rather, you've seen with the leaders the opposite of what you see with the people. You've seen what they call normalization. And actually that, another alhamdulillah thing, this whole thing is exposed, is the gap between the ordinary, sincere population of the Muslims who, like you say, they're saying to the military, if you're not going to go, let us go. But actually, actually the message we should be saying is no, it is your duty to go. Because as many of your speakers have said so far, when the Prophet ﷺ says, Man ra munkaran, bi yadih, that though if you see a munkar, then you change it with your hand if you are capable. It's not about stages of forbidding the munkar in terms of an option for you. Once you are capable, you have to do it. It becomes a responsible. For those of us who are capable of speaking, we must. We must. And one thing we should be speaking is speaking directly as much as we can through every means we can to make, carry the words of that sister, those sisters who are effectively today's women who are saying, ya wa muatasim. They're calling for the leaders to rescue them. They are giving voice to what actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran when he says, rajim, He is Allah is criticizing us when he says, What is the matter with you? You don't fight in the way of Allah. And again, we say we're not talking about individuals going to do something. We're not talking about small groups of people going to do something. We're talking about the people who took on the responsibility of joining an army of state. While what? While the oppressed people amongst men, women, and children, what are they doing? Those that are saying, Oh, our Lord, take us out, rescue us from this place of oppressive people. That is effectively a description of modern Gaza, modern Palestine. رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا مِنْ هَذِهِ الْقَرِيَةَ ظَالِمِ أَهْلُهَا وَاجْعَلْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيًّا وَاجْعَلْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ نَصِيرًا Allah, They're begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to appoint for us somebody to save us, to rescue us, appoint for us a helper. So in all of this, we see the Ummah realizing and actually saying, you know what? We love to help our brothers and sisters in Palestine with relief and aid and me medical aid and food. But actually, actually, we know what will rescue them from a state level military onslaught is a state level military response. Where is today Salahuddin? I've not met a Palestinian to this day that believes that liberation will come from within Palestine. And in, frankly, they are prisoners. It's not an obligation on them. They are waiting for the today's equivalent of Salahuddin, who does what? Who unifies the Muslims, unifies their resources, and uses that to liberate Palestine and rescue the people. That's where our voices need to be today, Dili. That's what we need to be calling for. We need to be joining those Muslims in Gaza, in Jordan, and elsewhere, who are demanding, why are you 
pointing your guns at the Muslims, preventing them from helping instead of you going to rescue the people in Palestine. They are calling you and you are not going. You should be ashamed of yourselves when your women and children are dying like this, suffering like this. And we have trust in Allah. We have trust in Allah. Why? Because he will carry this message and turn the hearts of people. We have seen evidence in the past of people where their hearts are turned, where we don't expect it. And he can carry this message. The most striking example is in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu because he went to tribe after tribe after tribe, approaching them, asking them for protection for this deen. And he was met with indifference, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was met with hostility, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, most famously in Taif, most infamously in Taif, I should say. He was met with hostility, but he kept doing it, he kept doing it. And Allah carried that message to the Aws and Khazaraj, who came and found him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we know that ours is the duty, we do our best, we use our voices to call for these armies to release, and we pray that Allah carries that message to their ears, and that they should act, and they must act, because they have the capability of doing it. That is the duty on them. In truth, in truth, I'll be honest with you, it's a duty now whether they're under their nation state of Jordan or Egypt or Turkey or Saudi or any of these, it's a, it's a duty on them. In truth, I don't expect that reality to happen until we have the return of the Khilafah. So this is something that is absolutely synergistic with this. It is absolutely complementary. And it, Truthfully, this is something which we know, we know we can see, and some of our speakers have mentioned before, the fact that America sent two aircraft carriers, the fact that the Britain has sent two naval ships, and openly Grant Chap said, it is because we are afraid of a wider regional conflict. They fear that their Sykes-Pico rulers and their Sykes-Pico borders are about to collapse like a domino. We saw in 1917, 1918, a massive geopolitical shakeup of the Middle East. They occupied the lands, they divided the lands, they implanted proxy client rulers and false batil kufr systems of rule in there, which have still to this day, a hundred more than a hundred years later, they have not taken root. And it's against that background that they installed the Zionist colony, the occupation of Palestine. That actually has to reverse. So it is about liberating Palestine, it is about unifying those lands again, and it is about reappointing a Khalifa who rules by what Allah has revealed. And you know, when people talk about peace in the region, I'd like to remind everyone, Muslim and non-Muslim, that the only time that land, that holy land, has seen any semblance of peace for any period of time, where Muslim, Jew, Christian can live side by side with justice and harmony, the only time is under Islam, under the Islamic Khilafah. From the time of Sayyidina Umar to the time of the Crusades, from the time of Salahuddin to the time of the fall of the Uthmani Khilafah and the occupation of Palestine in 1917. These are the only periods. You talk about peace. They talk about peace processes and peace solutions. All of these things which have just brought more and more and more war actually the only guarantee of that peace in that holy land is Islam, is the Khilafah. And that is something we should be very proud of as Muslims, and we should be very confident in calling for. That is a perfect cue for Roshan to play the next video, which is Netanyahu explaining what the Caliphate is to Piers Morgan during the CNN interview. Roshan, can you please play that? Because the people who want us out they don't want any Western presence here, and guess what? Increasingly, they don't want any Western presence here either. They have dreams of reestablishing the caliphate. Hmm. Shansar, over to you. Um, why is, do you think that that is a genuine fear or concern uh, to Western governments and state leaders and those who run the echelons of the international system, whether it be financial, political, or otherwise, or is this, or is this just fear-mongering? What do you think? I believe it is a fear, whether it's in the form of uh, Islamic caliphate. Some of them tend to frame this as Arab nationalism. So socialists tend to state 
that Arab nationalism is a threat to Israel and the West, but they do not understand the distinction between caliphate and Arab socialism in the sense that the drive of Islamic caliphate is based on Iman. And when you have a strength of Iman, it can uh, what they fear is a pan-Islamism, what they refer to as pan-Islamic thought, something that transcends nationalism, uh, something that's not limited to the, to the borders of any country. And it also means an overhaul of the financial system. And that is a greater threat for the West because at the moment Europe is hungry. And when the white man is hungry, they become warmongers. And that is what they have been doing throughout their history from Portugal, uh, Vasco de Gama and the naval crusades and Columbus and his search for India for spices and gold in order to recheck his diaries, Columbus's diaries. You will, 1492 was the year when the Muslims, just a few months earlier before Columbus's voyage, the Muslims had been removed from Spain. So that's not taught in your English uh, history classes that the Muslims had just been removed and then Columbus went to sail for gold uh, in India to retrieve gold for what? For the, the reconquering of Jerusalem. So wars are also economical and a caliphate entails the end of the Federal Reserve. It entails the end of the Bank of England and its control of capital and its control of finance and its control of uh, the, the petrodollar the the control of petrol uh, oil in the middle east and so many different things it has so many ramifications implications in the fact that if there is what they refer to as a pan islamic movement that transcends any one group it transcends one political movement it goes into the entire ummah and that is of course will be viewed definitely as a danger because if uh, if uh, north america can feel threatened by europe when Europe unites uh, a, a conglomerate of nations, or even by China, the, the perceived threat from China, I would say, uh, the perceived threat from China, or the perceived threat from Russia, if there is act an actual movement to uh, unite the nation states and uh, obliterate really the, the, uh, the system that controls the mind, meaning you, uh, look at all these Turkish nationalists, Pakistani nationalists, uh, various types of nationalists so brainwashed to the point that they uh, believe that that one nation is more important than the entire Ummah. Once that concept is removed, that does become a global threat for uh, Western ascendancy. Abdul Wahid, my final question to you, why does it have to be a Khilafah or nothing? In, in, in terms of, the Arab nations have intervened before. They have fought wars before, as in like the Arab-Israeli war, the, the Egyptians were involved, the Jordanians were involved, 67 more. I mean, I'm not talking about the success or sincerity or, or, or the plans behind closed doors. To, to say that uh, nation states can't intervene, sure, they'll intervene for the national interests, but can that, can, can that not be some relief? When Turkey intervened in, in Syria and created a buffer and f between themselves, they went against NATO, they intervened for its own interests. Uh, why does it have to be the intervention of a caliphate that would bring some relief and respite to the Muslim Gaza? Why can that not happen under a nation state? Why can that not happen through the intervention of a nation state? CC is operating currently for the interests of his nation state, which is to block refugees coming in, right? No, you, when a nation state thinks for itself, it will think selfishly. There's nothing in it for a nation state to sacrifice and go in to help people in another state. Nothing in it for them. Actually, why they intervened in the past was partly because they were nation states. And certainly in 1948, they were, the, the, they were looking to have a share of that pie, which was Palestine. They were not looking uh, for rescuing the people of Palestine. They were looking to have a share of that pie. In later wars, they were still rivaling with each other while they were allying with each other. The second thing is these nation states, particularly in the Middle East, are pretty slavishly do what they're told to do by the, their sponsor powers around the world. They don't really act in the independent interests of their people. They act in the independent interest. They act in the interests of their sponsors. 
Look, uh, Khilafah represents what? It represents the the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in its implementation on this earth. It represents the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu and his mercy in how he governed. In It represents the system of Islam and a different financial model, which Sheikh Asrar has mentioned, which fundamentally will challenge this capitalist system that makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. It actually represents a different way of how you view energy. Right. So at the moment, energy is either in the hands of royal families or in the hands of global conglomerates. And actually, we know from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, that energy and uh, and water uh, rights and what you can call public utilities in today's parlance is actually something which is for the people, for the ummah, for the public. So it's not actually something that should be hoarded in the hands of a few in today's world. Anyone who honestly looks at Europe or the United States will say they have a serious problem with a divided society. One half absolutely hates the other, all right? So what characterizes the left wing looks at the right as being racist, nationalist, petty-minded, greedy, all right? And the right wing looks at the left as if they've lost the plot, they can't even define what's the difference between a man and a woman, and they're allowing children to be all caught, taught all kinds of fitna. Khilafah represents a, actually a different civilizational model to the world. It actually represents something of hope and humanity for humanity, because Allah, the creator of humanity, knows how we are supposed to live as human beings. We're not supposed to be slaves to a company or slaves to the dollar or to the pound. We're supposed to be slaves to Allah, which means a certain way of living for humanity. Hilafa represents carrying that message to humanity as well, which was ultimately when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this, this kitab is to bring mankind out of the different dhulumat into a nur of Islam. It, it is the vehicle to do that. It is the body which, when Allah says we are the best ummah sent to mankind, to enjoin maruf for bin munkar, how do you do that as one billion on this earth without a leader to actually help and decide where you help humanity, where it's needed most? You can't enjoin maruf and for bin munkar as a one billion body of people without having a voice on the earth. So it represents all those things. And yet it will be a threat to Bibi Netanyahu. It will be a threat to the bankers and the corporates who get richer and richer. It will be a threat, but to ordinary people who are sick to death of how they are neglected and treated by their rulers and their governors, no. Especially in the Muslim world, absolutely no threat to them. In fact, it will not be a threat to the cows and the sheep and the chickens that are in batteries. It will not be a threat to the seas and the fish which are being polluted by companies. It will not be a threat to any of those because we believe in the book of Allah and we want to see it implemented. It represents a real civilizational opportunity and that's why it's a threat to the bad guys, frankly. Dr. Abdul Wahid Shah Sarar, Zakhullah Khairan for your time, uh, for concluding with uh, some powerful solutions an alternative way to think. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all the mashaykh uh, and the du'at and the activists who joined in and contributed today. May Allah accept it from them. I mean, I remind all our brothers and sisters who are still tuned in and are going to watch this later on to continue remembering our brothers and sisters in Gaza and all occupied lands in your du'as to give and do whatever you can within your capacity, but also understanding what your capacity is. Um, if there's one thing that I've taken from the concluding message from Sheikh Asar and Abdul Wahid is that as laity, we have our capacity. We don't have access to policy makers. We don't have access to uh, expelling uh, ambassadors and diplomats, cutting trade deals. We don't have that. We may know people who do, and those conversations need to happen with those people. Um, and most definitely, we've had decades of uh, betrayal, complicity, treachery um, from the neighboring Muslim regimes. And it's important that our viewers and listeners understand that we make a clear distinction. And it's actually something which Ahmed Hamouda said uh, on the live two days ago. He goes, we need to stop referring to them as leaders because they don't lead us in nothing. Uh, our leaders are those that are defined in the Quran and Sunnah. Um, and these people are not our leaders. 
So ultimately, what, if we do want a leadership that believes in Allah, His Messenger, and the final day, and has taqwa, then that requires a different type of conversation. And we should engage non-Muslims and Muslims alike when talking about these alternative civilizational talking points, that there is a rich history that we have, a beautiful, rich, long history that we have, that's documented by your historians, in your library books, in your history books. And we need to have those conversations. And then if the Jewish Chronicle is tuning in today, which I know they will do, and they're going to scroll through everything, I remind you that your ancestors and your forefathers and your predecessors lived in peace and security in the Islamic lands. I remind you that it was the Jews of uh, Spain that went to, that were given uh, protection and a home in the Ottoman lands. I say the same uh, for the Jews that were brought back to the Holy Lands by Umar ibn Khattab and the same by Salahuddin. And it was the Europeans and your Judeo-Christian brothers who expelled you consistently from those lands. And it was the Muslims who gave you back uh, and brought you back to settle and flourish. I will kindly ask everyone to continue making dua for all oppressed Muslims, for our Muslim brothers and sisters in Gaza, in Palestine, in Kashmir, in Myanmar, in East Turkestan, in every land where the Muslims are oppressed and occupied, keep them in your du'as. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah removes their fear and removes their opp oppression and occupation and replaces it with security and victory. I mean, um, Sheikh Sara will kindly ask you to conclude with the du'a. Jazakallah khairan. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, shakirin, wa salatu wa salamu ala sharaf al-anbiya sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Ya Allah, enable five pillars to counter the propaganda blitz that we view on our televisions and our newspapers. Ya Allah, make five pillars a strong force in the Western Hemisphere and internationally, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, enable uh, Dillian Roshan and the entire team to do uh, to carry out this jihad with the pen, Ya Allah, and to carry out the truth to the populations that are being brainwashed through propaganda. Ya Allah, enable us as Muslims to do what is right. Ya Allah, enable the Muslim Ummah to restore the Khilafah and restore its Amir who safeguards the Yatim, the orphan, and acts as a shield for the widows and protects the borders of the Muslims and distributes the zakat and uh, distribution of wealth, Ya Allah, who carries out social justice on the path of Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Ya Allah, we ask you that you have mercy on the shuhada in Gaza and all the fal all of Palestine in uh, Dafat al West Bank, in, in all of in Ramallah, in all the areas in, in Jerusalem. Ya Allah, safeguard those Muslims, strengthen, strengthen their heart and increase the strength in their hearts. Strengthen our weak hearts, Ya Allah. We as weak Muslims, Ya Allah, strengthen our hearts, strengthen our resolve, and enable us to do what is right. Ya Allah, unite the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa Baraka Ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa Ala Alaihi Wa Sahbihi Ajma'in. Brothers and sisters, if you watch this live stream, please share it with your friends, your family, and your contacts. Share with your non-Muslim friends. There's nothing There's nothing to hide in this four-hour conversation that we've had that, that's going to stop you or prevent you from sharing uh, far and wide. And until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.